We have read so far the story of Eustacia and Wild Dave, both dead. We will still have some stories left. The story of Glimmy O'Bright, the story of his cousin Thomasin. Will they cross each other's path or will they have diverse routes to follow? This is Monami Mukherjee and this is going to be the last video in the series. So let's read through the after courses and find out what happens to the characters who are left living on the plains of Ecton. The first chapter in After Courses reads, The Inevitable Movement Onward. Three very important words. Inevitable Movement Onward. So, by this, Hardy is trying to give us some hint that the ending of the novel, as shown in the After Courses, is going to be something that is inevitable, that is something that is bound to happen according to the laws of Egdon. So we will find out what inevitability is talking about. Then the word movement. So life doesn't stop with Eustacia and Wild Eve's death. It has to go on for those who are living. So the focus now shifts from that dark figure of Eustacia to the bright and sparkling, much unexplored figure of Thomasin. And we will see how life moves through her even when apparently things have stopped. And finally, onward gives us a positive direction toward which the storyline is going to progress in its final hours. The story of the deaths of Eustacia and Wild Eve was told throughout Egdon and far beyond. Now you can understand that in a place like Egdon Heath, where not much happens, uh, an incident of this large scale will have a really very big impact People will go on talking about this incident for ages and when people talk about something, sometimes they add details, sometimes they change details and things get a bit uh, different from what actually might have happened. All the known incidents of their love were enlarged, distorted, touched up and modified till the original reality bore but a slight resemblance to the counterfeit presentation. Counterfeit presentation means something which is told in place of uh, what has really happened, that is counterfeit, by surrounding tongues. Yet upon the whole, neither the man nor the woman lost dignity by sudden death. Uh, the point is, maybe people distorted uh, things a little, but they never presented Wild Eve and Eustacia uh, in a light which is not glorified. Misfortune had struck them gracefully, cutting off their erratic histories with a catastrophic dash instead of, as with many, attenuating each life to an uninteresting meagerness through long years of wrinkles, neglect and decay. Now when people grow old, what happens? They start to have their skins wrinkled and their features all turning grey and old. So when people die at an old age, people don't talk about that much. When people die at a young age, especially under these circumstances, people don't stop talking about them. So their sudden and young uh, death, you can say, uh, gave Eustacia and Wild Eve a kind of immortality through uh, different stories, different narrations that went on after their death. Now what was happening to Thomasin? She had become a widow. And she has her daughter with her and the name of the daughter is Eustacia. The spring came and calmed her. The summer came and soothed her. The autumn arrived and she began to be comforted. So you can see that with the passing of seasons, Egdon is having a gradually more and more calming effect on Thomasin's mind. For her little girl was strong and happy, growing in size and knowledge every day. Outward events flattered Thomas in not a little. So she was not a person who was disturbed by what was happening around the world or she had nothing to do with anything other than what was happening on Egdon Heath. Wild Eve had died interstate and she and the child were his only relatives. What does the word interstate mean? This word means that Wild Eve had died without making any particular will for his property because he never knew he was going to die so young so he hadn't made any will and under these circumstances generally the property passed to the widow uh, or the next dependent. Thankfully for Thomasin the property right of married woman the right on the husband's property uh, that uh, 
was in this case uh, in her favor and she could inherit whatever was left by wild Eve. When administration had been granted, all the debts paid and the residue of her husband's uncle's property, remember that inheritance which wild Eve had, had come into her hands, it was found that the sum waiting to be invested for her own and the child's benefit was little less than £10,000 and £10,000 back in those days meant a lot. So we can say she was well provided for. All right. Now, where was she staying? She was staying at Bloomsend. Klim was also at Bloomsend. And of course, because of their uh, mutual misfortunes, they found it fitting to be together in the same house so that they could at least you know, take care of each other, be with each other, although not technically with each other, but very close. Uh, to each other. So, Klim very gladly admitted her as a tenant, confining his own existence to two rooms at the top of the back staircase. So, Klim, he had a separate uh, living uh, area where he lived on quietly, shut off from Thomasine and the three servants she had thought fit to indulge in now that she was a mistress of money. So, now Thomasine could actually keep servants uh, for her uh, own benefit. Klim tried to be aloof, although they were living in the same house. His sorrows had made some change in his outward appearance. Now, of course, Klim was affected uh, in a worse way because he was already quite depressed after his mother's death. And again, he finds himself somehow responsible for Eustacia's death too. And unlike Thomas, he doesn't have any uh, child to you know, look at and feel comforted with. So we have a pretty broken man here. And yet the alteration was chiefly within. Now with Klim, the depression or the sadness uh, was not reflected so much on his face. It might have been said that he had a wrinkled mind. So Hadi has a way of playing with words. Uh, his face did not show the grief that he was having, it was his mind that was getting old and wrinkled like an old man. He had no enemies and he could get nobody to reproach him, which was why he so bitterly reproached himself. Now, since nobody blamed him for anything, he blamed himself. Now, imagine this situation, you know, Klim there, Thomas in there, both living under the same roof. What if you were the author? Here, what would you have done? How would their life uh, have responded under your authorship? Would you team up Clem and Thomason in a marital relationship? You might think that it is convenient for Thomason now to choose Clem and convenient for Clem to choose Thomason. Why, why could that be a problem? It would be a marriage of convenience, wouldn't it be? But is marriage about convenience? Isn't it actually about something else? Okay, let's see how Hardy deals with this. We see a lot of description uh, for Klim here. He frequently walked the heath alone when the past seized upon him with its shadowy hand. When he was driven by ghosts from his past, he used to walk about in the heath and held him there to listen to its tale. His imagination would then people the spot with its ancient inhabitants. Suppose he is walking alone on the heath. There is nobody around. But he knows about the history of the place. So he can imagine people there, you know, walking about him. Imaginary figures. Forgotten Celtic tribes trod their tracks about him and he could almost live among them. Look in their faces, see them standing beside the barrows which swelled around untouched and perfect as at the time of their erection. So he was transporting himself to a past age when Celts and uh, these original inhabitants were there on the heath producing its first producers. And we can see that with this kind of description, or we can say that the return of the native is complete or getting completed. Now, returning doesn't mean returning to a geographical location. 
Returning means returning to the roots. And this root, this history is what makes Klim's return complete. And he can reach this point when he is absolutely isolated from the rest of the civilization. Now in this way life was going on when one day Klim heard Thomasin speak to somebody when that person was entering. Oh, how you frightened me, she said to someone who had entered. I thought you were the ghost of yourself. Klim was curious enough to advance a little further and look in at the window. So Klim heard Thomasin speaking out to somebody. Now, who was this person? To his astonishment, there stood within the room Diggory Venn, no longer a riddle man, but exhibiting the strangely altered hues, hues means colors, Strangely altered hues of an ordinary Christian countenance, white shirt front, light flowered waistcoat, blue spotted neckerchief and bottle green coat. So he was wearing pretty ordinary, although very decent clothes. He was not red. Nothing in this appearance was at all singular. Now there was nothing peculiar about his dress other than the fact that this was peculiar because Earlier, he never used to wear such dress. So this fact made it peculiar. Red and all approach to red. Approach to red means orange, brown, dark brown, chocolate. All these earthy colors which look very close to red was carefully excluded from every article of clothes upon him. It's as if he did not want to associate himself with red anymore. He was sick and tired of that color. For what is there that persons just out of harness dread so much as reminders of the trade which has enriched them? So it was like a harness. It was as if he was tied to this profession. And the moment he set himself free, he wanted to get rid of that color which is associated with that profession. So we don't have a little man anymore. We will have only Diggory Fenn. Your bride went round to the door and entered. I was so alarmed, said Thomasin. And she was smiling actually. I couldn't believe that he had got white of his own accord. It seemed supernatural. Now Diggory Fenn was considered to be a ghost by the people of Egdon when he was red. Now that he is not red, Thomasin feels that he has become a ghost of himself. I gave up dealing in riddle last Christmas, said Ven. It was a profitable trade and I found that by the time I had made enough to take the dairy of 50 cows that my father had in his lifetime. So he was in the profession uh, of riddle because it gave him enough return to be able to procure 50 cows and set up his own dairy like his father. I always thought of getting to that place again if I changed at all and now I am there. How did you manage to become white, Diggory? Thomasin asked. And Thomasin is in a very cheerful uh, state at this moment. I turned so by degrees, ma'am. So he washed and washed and washed his reddle off his skin and he became white now. And then Thomasin makes a very casual remark here. You look much better than ever you did before. She's actually trying to say that you look pretty good now. Ven appeared confused. And Thomasin, seeing how inadvertently she had spoken to a man who might possibly have tender feelings for her still. Now we know that Riddle Man had feelings for Thomasin. Thomasin herself knew that. So now she realizes that, okay, I gave a compliment to a man who might have some feelings for me. So this is awkward. Blushed a little and she responded in a way. Klim saw nothing of this and added good humoredly. What was Klim saying here? What shall we have to frighten Thomasin's baby with? Now you have become a human being again. <laughs> uh, you know, this is funny because uh, sometimes when children didn't sleep at night, maybe the parents said that sleep fast because otherwise a riddle man will come and take you. So the idea of riddle man as a frightening thing that was part of folklore uh, and it happens all the time and Klim is trying to make this uh, silly comment here. What I want you to notice is that he uses the expression Thomasin's baby. He doesn't say the name of the baby. We know that. I don't know. Maybe he is not comfortable yet calling somebody Eustacia. 
not after what has happened. Anyway, so we have Diggory coming again after a few days and asking for permission from Thomasin if the village folk, they could uh, raise a maypole just outside their premises. Now, maypole is this long pole. Uh, it's a festival where uh, people dance around that pole and it's full of merriment. It's very similar to the gypsying festival we had. Thomasin does not object at all and she is pretty enthusiastic about this and says that I don't mind them having a maypole outside my house. Ven warns her, but you might not like to see a lot of folk going crazy around a stick under your very nose. So stick is that pole. I shall have no objection at all. So Thomasin is really looking forward to some activity here. You know, you're stuck in with your cousin who doesn't talk much. You have a baby growing up. That is consolation, but life doesn't go on with only consolations. You need activities and this maypole dancing that was going to happen around her house will be cheering her up, as she thought. So on the day of that maypole dance, she gets ready and after a long time, she dresses up pretty well. Klim sees her. That she is all dressed up and says, How pretty you look today, Thomasin, he said. Is it because of the maypole? Not altogether. And then she blushed and dropped her eyes, which he did not specially observe, though her manner seemed to him to be rather peculiar, considering that she was only addressing himself. When she says not altogether, it means that no, maypole is not the only reason why I am dressed. Then Klim is thinking, what is the real reason then? And he starts to think, could it be possible that she had put on her summer clothes to please him? So Klim now was looking at Thomasin uh, with a different kind of an attitude, with a different what if scenario in his mind. So now we have some description of what's going on in Klim's mind. He recalled her conduct towards him throughout the last few weeks when they had often been working together in the garden. So now he starts thinking about their childhood. You know, they grew up together, working together, playing together. And his mother always had this dream of seeing them settled together as husband and wife. Klim started to think about her actions in the past few weeks. You know, they were working in the garden together, just like they used to do when they were kids. And then he started to think, what if her interest in him were not so entirely that of a relative as it had formerly been? So what if she is interested in him in a different way now? To your bright, any possibility of this sort was a serious matter. And he almost felt troubled at the thought of it. Why was he troubled? Let's find out. Every pulse of lover-like feeling which had not been stilled during Eustacia's lifetime, had gone into the grave with her. So whatever passion he had as a lover was gone with Eustacia. His passion for her had occurred too far on in his manhood to leave fuel enough on hand for another fire of that sort. So it's as if his potential as a lover was exhausted by Eustacia's death. And that's why he was troubled that he would not be able to give Thomas in the kind of love, the kind of passion that she deserves. Even supposing him capable of loving again, that love would be a plant of slow and laboured growth and in the end only small and sickly like an autumn hatched bird. So uh, this kind of nature imagery that Hardy is using here is very remarkable. The meaning is that Klim knows that he won't be able to love any woman uh, with the kind of fiery passion which he felt for Eustacia. And so he is not very happy at this moment with the situation where Thomasine might be showing interest in him. So the Maypole Day came and it went away because Klim did not participate in the dance. He actually went out of the back door, escaped the place because he was not comfortable uh, with people, you know, having fun, enjoying themselves. So he went away and 
when he came back, he saw that Thomasin was there. And she told him that uh, because of his absence, she could not go to the Maypole event either. So let's read this part. She looked at him reproachfully. You went away just when it began, Clem, she said. Yes, I felt I could not join in. You went out with them, of course. No, I did not. You appeared to be dressed on purpose. Yes, but I could not go out alone. So many people were there. One is there now. So during the Maypole dance, number of people gathered there. It was a big crowd. And at the time of this conversation, one person was still standing in front of that Maypole. And she could see that person from there. Your bride strained his eyes across the dark green patch beyond the paling and near the black form of the maypole, he discerned a shadowy figure. So, Klim's eyesight, we know it's not very good. And he strained to focus on a figure which was standing and then he could make out a shadowy shape. Sauntering idly up and down, who is it? He said. So, who is still standing there? Mr. Venn, said Thomasin. You might have asked him to come in, I think, Tamsi. Note the word Tamsi. So it's a term of endearment. Whoever is very close to Thomasin calls her Tamsi. He has been very kind to you first and last. So why is he out there? Why don't you have him inside offer some tea? I will now, she said, and acting on the impulse, went through the wicket to where Venn stood under the maypole. So, she goes out and reaches Diggory Venn. It is Mr. Venn, I think, she inquired. Now, Venn was standing there. Thomasin went there. She invited him in. He refused to come. So, Thomasin said, why are you here? Uh, are you still, uh, you know, in the mood of remembering those moments you had? Maybe you were dancing with somebody. And then Diggory said, yes, kind of, and I'm waiting for the moon to rise. So Thomasin said, why are you waiting for the moon to rise? You want to enjoy those memories again under the moonlight? Memories of dancing with some woman maybe uh, during the Maypole festival? Diggory said, no, I'm waiting for the moon to rise because then I'll be able to look for a maiden's glove. Thomasin was speechless with surprise. That a man who had to walk some four or five miles to his home, like he had actually to walk a long distance, so he was waiting for the moonrise, should wait here for such a reason pointed to only one conclusion. The man must be amazingly interested in that glove's owner. So maybe that woman whose glove he is going to find out after moonrise, was very attractive. That's why Venn was rooted in that spot. Were you dancing with her, Diggory? She asked in a voice which revealed that he had made himself considerably more interesting to her by this disclosure. No, he was not dancing with that girl. But he wants to get the glove. And you will not come in then? Not tonight, thank you, ma'am. Shall I lend you a lantern to look for the young person's glove, Mr. Venn? So she wants to help. Maybe she is very curious to see the glove. Oh no, it is not necessary, Mrs. Wildeef. Thank you. The moon will rise in a few minutes. Thomasin was quite puzzled. She goes back. She speaks to Klim that no, he is not going to come. Klim goes back to his own room. Thomasin goes back to hers, checks the baby is sleeping or not and then goes to the window, looks outside. Ven was still there. At last Ven appeared to find it. Whereupon he stood up and raised it to his lips. So he had found that glove he was looking for and he picked it up and kissed it. Then placing it in his breast pocket, the nearest receptacle to a man's heart permitted by modern raiment. So here yeah, raiment means garment, suit. So the breast pocket is the closest place to your heart. And when put that glove in his breast pocket, which apparently shows that this person to whom this glove belonged to was very special to Ven. He ascended the valley in a mathematically direct line toward his distant home in the meadows. So Ven goes away. Thomasin is pretty puzzled. 
how can somebody be so stupid to you know just stand there waiting for the moon to rise just for somebody's glove well we come to chapter 2 Thomasine walks in a green place by the Roman road. So this is a very happy chapter uh, which begins in a very funny way. Thomasine was upstairs and she was getting ready and she started uh, calling for Rachel, the servant, the servant girl. Rachel was a girl about 13 who carried the baby out for earrings and she came up upstairs at the call. So she was a very young woman of only 13 years. Have you seen one of my last new gloves about the house, Rachel? Inquired Thomasin. It is the fellow to this one. So she was holding one of the pair and the other piece was missing. Gloves, remember? Rachel did not reply. Why don't you answer? said her mistress. I think it is lost, ma'am. Lost? Who lost it? I never worn them but once. Rachel appeared as one dreadfully troubled and at last began to cry. Please, ma'am, all the day of the maypole I had none to wear and I see it yours on the table and I thought I would borrow them. I did not mean to hurt them at all, but one of them got lost. Somebody gave me some money to buy another pair for you, but I have not been able to go anywhere to get them. Who somebody? So who gave you money to buy me a pair of gloves? Mr. Venn. Did he know it was my glove? Yes, I told him. So, for whose glove was the little man waiting that day? Thomasin gets hold of Diggory Venn later, out on a walk, and she says, Diggory, give me my glove. Pretty direct, said Thomasin, whose manner it was under any circumstances to plunge into the midst of a subject which engrossed her. So she was not a person who wasted a lot of time talking about things here and there. She jumped straight to the point always. When, equally to the point, dismounted from his horse, put his hand in his breast pocket and handed the glove. So the glove was always there with him. Thank you. It was very good of you to take care of it. It is very good of you to say so. Look at the formal approach. It's hilarious. Oh no, I was quite glad to find you had it. Everybody gets so indifferent that I was surprised to know you thought of me. Now Thomas is being a little more forward here. If you had remembered what I was once, you wouldn't have been surprised. So Dren says that, well, you know or rather if you remember uh, what I was once, how much I cared for you, you wouldn't be surprised that I am caring for you now even. I know, but men of your character are mostly so independent. Why is she saying this? Because see, Dickory Venn is not a person who can be easily assessed. Uh, he is disappearing every now and then and Yes, he's always available when you need him. But most of the time, you don't know where he is. He's independent. So, Thomasin says that, I'm not sure if, uh, you know, normal feelings can be associated with people like you who are so independent. What is my character? He asked. I don't exactly know. Except it is to cover up your feelings under a practical manner. All I know about you is that you don't express what you feel. And only to show them when you are alone. Ah, how do you know that? Now, when she says that when expresses himself when he is alone, she is referring to the moment when under that moonlit sky, he had picked up the glove and kissed it. So that was expression of great tenderness. Now she cannot tell him that I was seeing what you were doing. Then Ven would say, why were you looking at me? So she says that because, um, because I do. So she doesn't clearly tell him how she knows how he behaves when he's alone. You mustn't judge by folks in general. Still, I don't know much what feelings are nowadays. I have got so mixed up with business of one sort and the other that my soft sentiments are gone off in vapor-like. Yes, I'm given up body and soul to the making of money. Money is all my dream. 
<laughs> so Redelman is not showing any interest to her yet, although she very well understands that he's trying to hide his feelings. Third chapter, the serious discourse of Klim with his cousin. Since that day of the Maypole incident, Klim was having these thoughts about the probability or possibility of any union between himself and Thomasin. And here Hardy writes, Had only Yobright's own future been involved, he would have proposed to Thomasin with a ready heart. He had nothing to lose by carrying out a dead mother's hope. We know Klim is feeling so guilty about his mother and he knows that his mother would have loved him to marry Thomasin. So this urge to propose to Thomasin uh, was more like an act of reconciliation with his mother in a way. But he dreaded to contemplate Thomasin wedded to the mere corpse of a lover that he now felt himself to be. He knows that he would not be a very lively husband for her. He had but three activities alive in him. One was his almost daily walk to the little graveyard wherein his mother lay. So he went on to visit his mother's grave. Another, his just as frequent visits by night to the more distant enclosure which numbered his Eustachia among its dead. Walk to Eustachia's grave at night. And the third thing, the third was self-preparation for a vocation, for a profession which he was going to enter, which alone seemed likely to satisfy his cravings. And what was his plan now? What he would do? That of an itinerant preacher of the 11th commandment. He would be a preacher and he would tell people or explain to people different aspects of morality, ethics, codes of behavior. It was difficult to believe that Thomasin would be cheered by a husband with such tendencies as this. Well, visit to the mother's grave is fine, but if Thomasin finds out that he visits Eustachia's grave every night, I don't think she would be very excited about it. Anyways, he still thought that he should go and propose to Thomasin to secure their mutual interests. So he goes and speaks to her one day. I have long been wanting, Thomasin, he began, to say something about a matter that concerns both our futures. And Thomasin is pretty intelligent, she understands. And you are going to say it now? Just stop a minute, Klim, and let me speak first. For oddly enough, I have been wanting to say something to you. She doesn't want Klim to tell her anything before she tells what she is planning to do. Why? Because she knows that once Klim says what he has come to say, it would be a difficult situation that she will be into. Both of them will be. So she wants to say first. By all means, say on, Dempsey. I suppose nobody can overhear us. And then she says, well, first you will promise me this, that you won't be angry and call me anything harsh if you disagree with what I propose. And then she says, what I want is your advice. She is not asking for any permission here. She is asking for advice. Her, you are my relation. I mean, a sort of guardian to me, aren't you, Klim? Well, yes, I suppose I am a sort of guardian. And then he's a bit confused. I'm thinking of marrying. We know that Thomasin jumps straight to the point. No nonsense girl here. But I shall not marry unless you assure me that you approve of such a step. Why don't you speak? Clem is quite speechless here. He wants to guess who the person is. I was taken rather by surprise. Uh, but nevertheless, I am very glad to hear such news. I shall approve, of course, dear Tamsi. Who can it be? I am quite at a loss to guess. No, I am not. It is the old doctor. Not that I mean to call him old. For he is not very old after all. Ah, I noticed when he attended you last time. So the doctor here means the person who came to uh, attend to her when she was having her baby maybe. No, no, she said hastily. She doesn't want him to make any more guesses. It is Mr. Venn. Tim's face suddenly became grave. There, now, you don't like him and I wish I hadn't mentioned him. She exclaimed almost petulantly. And I shouldn't have done it either. Only he keeps on bothering me so till I don't know what to do. 
So Thomas says that, see, I didn't want to be with him. I don't want to disturb you with this kind of information. I don't want to be engaged with this man. Okay, but he's so constantly present. Klim continued to look downwards. I like Ven well enough. He's a very honest and at the same time astute man. He's clever too, as is proved by his having got you to favor him. But really, Thomason, he's not quite gentleman enough for me. That is just what I feel. I'm sorry now that I asked you and I won't think any more of him. Okay, then if you think that he's not good enough for me, then I won't marry him. At the same time, I must marry him if I marry anybody. Now, she will not marry if Klim is not happy with the union. But if she is not allowed to get married to Ven, she will not marry anybody else. Now, we might see Thomasin as a very soft girl. But imagine what she has done earlier. Earlier too, she was capable of somehow managing to get consent even in a very twisted way from somebody as hard as Mrs. Eobright when she wanted to get married to Wildiv. When even Wildiv did not want to get married to her in the first place. So this woman is not to be taken very lightly. If you are an inhabitant of a heathland, you would know that there are two kinds of plants. One very erect, tall, strong, you know, eustachia-like trees. And there are these plants of grasses which are so fragile to look at. One gash of wind and that tree topples down. That pliant grass will bow down but will never uproot from its point. That is Thomasin. Thomasin will appear to be accepting everything when in reality she is the one who decides what's going to happen to her life. And she is capable of getting exactly what she wants. Now, Klim is not very happy with the way the conversation is progressing. You might marry a professional man or somebody of that sort by going into the town to live and forming acquaintances there. You can go to the town now that you have money. I'm not fit for town life. So very rural and silly as I always have been. Now, Thomasin knows that she loves Egdon. She loves the simplicity of life here and she can adjust here. And that kind of touches a chord in Klim's heart. Maybe Klim thinks that, okay, this is what I wanted in my wife too. Sadly, Eustachia was not like this. Next day, there is again this conversation between them. He is much more respectable now than he was then. So you see, this is Thomasin. She will be persistent, continuous. And when you drop water, even if it is... Uh, drop by drop, only one single drop at a time, it will manage to corrode the hardest of surfaces. And this is Thomasin, drop of argument, one after the other, consistently, persistently. Who? Oh yes, Tigirivan. Aunt only objected because he was a little man. So now she knows that the way to get Klim's permission, or not permission, she wants everybody to be happy with her decision. See, she has money. She doesn't need Klim's permission. But why does she want this? Because she wants everybody to be happy with what she has decided. Otherwise, she feels that her happiness is not complete. She knows that the way to approach Klim is through his mother, dead mother. And she says, now that he's not a little man, maybe aunt wouldn't have minded. Well, Thomasin, perhaps I don't know all the particulars of my mother's wish. So you had better use your own discretion. Now, Klim knows that he's basically powerless. When Thomasin decides something, she decides. And he says that, okay, I think you should go ahead with what you decide. Don't drag me into this. You will always feel that I slighted your mother's memory. So she wants Klim to be enthusiastic about her marriage with Dickery and says that, no, I don't want you to think that I disregarded aunt's wishes because aunt did not wish me to marry Dickery because he was a little man. No, I will not. I shall think you are convinced that 
Had she seen Diggory in his present position, she would have considered him a fitting husband for you. So, Clem is now consoling her. See the strategy of Thomasin. She is not a villain in this. This is a very sweet thing in her. She wants everybody to agree to what she is seeing or doing. So, now Clem is in fact consoling her and saying that no, no, you are not disregarding my mother. You have this idea in your mind that if my mother were alive and if Diggory came as a white man doing a decent profession or engaged in a decent profession, she would agree. That's why you are marrying him. So, I will never think that you have disregarded my mother. Now, that's my real feeling. Don't consult me anymore. But do as you like, Thomasin. I shall be content. Tim is not very enthusiastic about it. And I don't know, maybe he was using his mother's dream of his and Thomasin's married life as a pretext. He actually maybe wanted to be with her, you know, and we know how Klim is. Klim, he was in Paris and he comes to Egden. Why? Because he cannot live alone. Eustacia leaves him in a very bitter way and without any gesture from her side, he calls her back in a letter. Why? Because he was feeling lonely. Now again, there is a time when he is severely feeling lonely and this man hates to be left alone. Naturally, he is going to hate the fact that Thomasin is also going to leave him. Okay. So more than desire, more than love, more than anything else, Claim needs to be with people. Although he is not a great conversationalist, he won't speak to you much. He won't talk to you about normal things other than his intellectual ideas, but he wants you around. Chapter 4 gets us a cheerful end. Cheerfulness again asserts itself at Bloom's end and Klim finds his vocation. We see the natives celebrating the wedding. Thomasin and Diggory, they get married to each other. Um, I want to focus on the part where we are left with Charlie and Klim. Klim, who had been with these uh, people, with this couple, when they were getting married at the church. And then when they returned, he managed to escape the part because he did not want to be a part of the festivities. He did not want to be there when they were having drinks and enjoying. So he escapes into the heat and there he meets Charlie. Charlie was there. Charlie, I have not seen you for a length of time, said your bride. Do you often walk this way? No, the lad replied. I don't often come outside the bank. You were not at the maypole? In that maypole festival, you did not come? No, said Charlie, in the same listless tone. I don't care for that sort of thing now. I don't like celebrations. You rather liked Miss Eustacia, didn't you? Your bride gently asked. Eustacia actually told him about uh, Charlie's um, inclinations towards her. Yes, very much. Uh, I wish... Yes, so he wishes something. I wish Mr. Eubright, you could give me something to keep that once belonged to her, if you don't mind. This is sad. Charlie is asking for something to remember Eustacia from her husband. I shall be happy to. It will give me very great pleasure, Charlie. Let me think what I have of hers that you would like. But come with me to the house and I'll see. And they go together uh, and they take the back entrance. Your bride goes to his room. Your bride searched his desk and taking out a sheet of tissue paper unfolded from it two or three undulating locks of raven hair which fell over the paper like black streams. From these he selected one, wrapped it up and gave it to the lad, whose eyes had filled with tears. So Klim did not give it all. He kept some for himself. Eustacia's strands of hair preserved as her memory. So he shares with Charlie the memory of his lost wife, his dead wife. He kissed the packet, put it in his pocket and said in a voice of emotion, Oh, Mr. Klim, how good you are to me. And then they start walking a little together and these natives uh, were celebrating 
the wedding feast with Thomasin and Diggory. Uh, and Clem and Charlie were walking past that place. And amid the noise of merriment from below, they descended. Their path to the front led them close to a little side window, whence the rays of candles streamed across the shrubs. The window being screened from general observation by the bushes had been left unblinded. So if somebody was standing there, they could see what was happening inside the uh, room. So that a person in this private nook could see all that was going on within the room which contained the wedding guests. Klim, uh, although his sight was getting better nowadays because of the unpolluted uh, environment of the heat, Still, he had a weak eyesight, so he says, Charlie, what are they doing? My sight is weaker again tonight and the glass of this window is not good. So Charlie wiped his own eyes, which were rather blurred with moisture because he was weeping, remembering Eustacia. Mr. Vane is asking Christian Cantil to sing. So he is now narrating to claim whatever is happening inside that room, that they are enjoying themselves. And then he says, Yes, I can hear the old man's voice, said Klim. So there is to be no dancing, I suppose. And is Thomas in the room? I see something moving in front of the candles that resembles a shape, I think. Yes, she do seem happy. So Charlie is describing. She is red in the face and laughing at something Fairway has said to her. Oh my. And then there's a noise. What noise was that? Mr. Venn is so tall that he knocked his head against the beam. So they were, um, of course, they were drinking and uh, Diggory was a little maybe tipsy and he bumped into that beam. Mrs. Venn has run up quite frightened and now she's put her hand to his head to feel if there's a lump. And now they be all laughing again as if nothing had happened. Do any of them seem to care about my not being there? Somehow I feel that Klim shouldn't have asked this to Charlie. He is kind of inviting Charlie to tell him things which maybe are not even true. And Charlie, he has understood that this man is feeling severely lonely. And who knows, Charlie doesn't want Klim to feel that good also. So he says, not a bit in the world. Now they are all holding up their glasses and drinking somebody's health. So they are just having a toast. I wonder if it is mine. No, it is Mr. and Mrs. Vance because he is making a hearty sort of speech. So he is forgotten in that party. And Charlie enforces the idea. There now Mrs. Venn has got up and is going away to put on her things, I think. So that party ends. And then the time comes when they will take leave of Klim. They will be going their own way. Klim will stay back in his place. Now we leave you in absolute possession of your own house again, said Thomasin as she bent down to wish her cousin good night. It will be rather lonely for you, Klim, after the hubbub we have been making. So she is very happy. And we are happy for her too, definitely. Especially because that little girl will now really have a father and a mother to care for her. And both Thomasin and Diggory seem to be very practical people who would really know how to best raise her. Oh, that's no inconvenience, said Klim, smiling rather sadly. And then the party drove off and vanished in the nightshades and Yobright entered the house. Yobright comes into his lonely room. The ticking of the clock was the only sound that greeted him, for not a soul remained. Christian, who acted as cook, valet, gardener to claim, sleeping at his father's house. So Christian Cantle, he was sleeping at Grandfather Cantle's house. Yobright sat down in one of the vacant chairs and remained in thought a long time. His mother's old chair was opposite. It had been sat in that evening by those who had scarcely remembered that it ever was hers. So the people who came there to party, they were sitting in that chair which belonged to Mrs. Eobright and nobody mentioned her, definitely. Now, this is very natural. When people are happy, they tend to forget sad incidents, traumatic pasts. But Klim cannot get over it. 
but to claim she was almost a presence there now as always whatever she was in other people's memories in his she was a sublime saint whose radiance even his tenderness for eustacia could not obscure but his heart was heavy that mother had not crowned him in the day of his espousals in the day of the gladness of his heart so in his wedding his mother had not blessed him and even had borne out the accuracy of her judgment she had said that this woman is going to be the ruin of your life and that has taken place in reality he should have heeded her for eustacia's sake even more than for his own if he had listened to her and not married eustacia eustacia would be alive it was all my fault he whispered oh my mother my mother would to god that i could live my life again and endure for you what you endured for me so he is suffering so much because he never had to suffer for his mother the way his mother suffered for him now hardy gets us to this last scene there is this barrow rain barrow and a person is standing there in the same way he described to stacia vine the very beginning of this book the speaker was bareheaded and the breeze at each waft gently lifted and lowered his hair so there was this person standing was speaking and there was this light breeze somewhat too thin for a man of his years so the hair was not very dense these still numbering less than 33 so this man was near about 33 years old he wore a shade over his eyes and his face was pensive and lined but though those bodily features were marked with decay there was no defect in the tones of his voice so there was a sign of uh, tiredness on his face but his voice was very soothing he stated that his discourses to people were to be sometimes secular and sometimes religious but never dogmatic so he decided to talk about morals ethics as i was telling you and that his text would be taken from all kinds of books this afternoon the words were as follows so we have a little piece from what he was talking about and the king rose up to meet her and bowed himself unto her and sat down on his throne and caused a seat to be set for the king's mother and she sat on his right side then she said i desire one small petition of thee i pray thee say me not nay and the king said unto her ask on my mother for i will not say the name and see the part which hardy selected it is an incident where a king is submitting to the wishes of the mother as if it's like he is pining for the time when he had said no to his mother so this is how it happens you know you keep on trying to correct your mistakes if you are guilty about something and uh, he's trying to tell people teach people about realities uh, which he thinks he has realized in his life your bright had in fact found his vocation in the career of an itinerant open air preacher and lecturer on morally unimpeachable subjects and from this day he labored incessantly in that office speaking not only in simple language on rain barrow and in the hamlets around so he used simple language and this was very important too because he understood that complex texts were not accessible to the people of egdon and its neighborhood so he wanted to make that complicated subject matter reachable to people uh, who were illiterate mostly and he continued to do this not just in these places but also in little more cultivated places or cultured places from the steps and porticos of town halls from market crosses from conduits on his planets and on wharves from the parapets of bridges in barns and outhouses and all other such places in the neighboring wessex towns and villages so he tried to give to this world whatever he thought was inside his mind and on the on the books that he found useful and this last part is very remarkable some believed him and some believed not people listened to him and 
Why did they listen to him? Did they believe him? Maybe they did. Maybe they did not. Some said that his words were commonplace. Others complained of his want of theological doctrine. When people are very educated, they said that, no, he's not good enough. Sometimes people said he's using too simple language. While others again remarked that it was well enough for a man to take to preaching who could not see to do anything else. Now, some people said that, okay, uh, he cannot see well, so at least he's doing something. <laughs> so that was a different kind of an approach. But everywhere he was kindly received. Why? Why was everybody kind to him? For the story of his life had become generally known. So it happens that when you are suffering or you have suffered a lot, people tend to be so sympathetic. No matter what you do, what you say to them, they will listen to you. So Hardy ends with, you can say, a de-glamorized claim here, who is worthy because of his misfortunes, whose words sell because they come from a man who has suffered. After courses, technically, you can say, like desserts after a meal, supposed to leave you with sweetness in your mouth, make you forget the bitterness of what has gone before. The whole idea of after courses, of providing a relief, you can say, post-catharsis, was not very compatible with Hardy's view of life, tragic view of life. But he kind of gives you this idea that whoever, whoever was in tune with nature, uh, was ultimately rewarded by nature, and who went against nature, were destroyed ruthlessly. So after courses is more like a revelation of Thomason's character, little nuances in her, and in a way gives us a satisfaction as readers that all's well, that ends well. And the kind of character which we have understood Klim to be, he is best left alone, trust me. Thank you for being with me in this wonderful journey. And it is because of you that I have turned the pages of The Return of the Native after almost 20 years. There were moments of deja vu for me. And again, I don't know if she's watching. This book was brought to life in class, in our classroom, by my most beloved professor, Dr. Indrani Chaudhuri Dutt of Lady Prabhupada College. If anybody, anybody is there watching who is a student of that college, please tell her how much she has helped shape people like us and how much we will always be grateful to her. Anyway, thank you all for being with me. If you want me to have detailed discussion on any characters or any aspects of this novel, do write them down in the comment section. See you all in my next video. Till then, stay happy, stay subscribed. This is Monami Mukherjee signing off. Bye.